The following podcast is by Mr. Jim Taylor, elder law and special needs attorney, helping and protecting those who need long-term care. And welcome back everyone to Answers for Elders Radio Network with Jim Kaler, attorney at law. And before we get started, Jim, I want to make sure that our listeners know how to reach you. Um, why don't we, uh, I know it's protectingseniors.com, correct? Is your, yep. is your website? Yep. Protectingseniors.com um, is my website. If you want to read my blogs, <laughs> I haven't yes. blogged in several years, but they are at protectingseniorsnews.com. Uh-huh. Okay. And the, the website name comes from my tagline, which is protecting seniors and people with special needs. Yes. And of course, on Answers for Elders, Jim has his own specialist page on our website. So for those of you that are interested in reaching out to him, um, we just heard a story of someone from North Carolina called you about somebody that's in Akron, Ohio. So that was perfect. So yeah. you are based in Ohio and certainly have connections to um, other uh, attorneys across the country. So we definitely love having you on this program. And certainly you're helping us deal with this very, very complicated world of elder law, which, Thank you know, you. I, there's no way in the world I could even begin. And I sometimes will have people ask me questions and I will go, you need an elder law attorney. <laughs> you absolutely do. So yeah, we anyway. are nerds among nerds. Yes, you are. I'm, you're amazing. Yeah. In, in addition to my website, uh, I have an answers for elders specific email address. If you want to email me directly, it goes into yes. my main box, but I give very specific email addresses so I can figure out how people found me. Yes. It's J Kaler, my first initial J and my name, K O E W L E R mm-hmm. hyphen or dash. Uh, AFE for Answers for Elders. So Jay Kaler hyphen AFE at protectingseniors.com. Perfect. Perfect. And I know we have that email address on your specialist page as well. So for those of you that are interested in reaching out to Jim, I know he's more than happy to talk to you and uh, point you in the right direction. So um, when we need you desperately (laughs) to, to discover. So anyway, we're just, you framed up this real complicated situation between resources and assets and income and what all that means. Now we're moving on to obviously the next step, which has to do with income. Okay. So the, the baseline, the, the place to start discussing income when we are not talking a specific person. Okay. If I'm talking to a client, I know they're married or they're not married. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when we're talking in generalities, like we are on this podcast, let's start with income for a single person, okay. Okay? because income for a spouse builds out of understanding income for a single person. Got it. So remember the main tenant of Medicaid as written in the law is we are here to help people pay for care when they can't afford to pay for it themselves. The the unspoken tenant is we don't want to pay a penny more than absolutely necessary. And all too often we want to avoid paying even the people we should be paying. But, right. but once someone is on Medicaid, their income is spoken for in most states because most states consider themselves income first states. The person, the Medicaid recipient's income is used first before Medicaid dollars. So There are, uh, for a single person, there are three places where income is going to go. Usually, we'll talk about people who have, and this, imagine this concept in the real world. People have too much income. Um, Putting air quotes around that for those of you who are not watching me visually. Um, There, under under Medicaid rules, there is such a thing as too much income. That's at least an installment by itself. Okay. okay. We'll get to that later. So for people who, uh, it, now, even if you have too much income, it all ends up the same place with maybe one little tweak to pay for a special bank account. Okay. That's okay. the only difference uh, on where the income goes. So if you have too much in, if you have, uh, if you're a single person, your income is going to go first to your personal needs allowance. We talked about that in the last installment right. where in, in Ohio, it's 50 bucks and Washington, it's 60 bucks. And in California, I think it's 130 or hundred or some, some big number compared to everywhere else. But of course their cost of living is big compared to everybody else's. Sure. Uh, Iowa is 30 last I heard. Um, and now don't quote me on these numbers because they could change anytime, but this is just 
elder law attorney gossip. The Ohio mm-hmm. numbers I know. Okay. Um, so that's your spending money. That's candy bars at the, at the snack bar uh, or uh, your, your cable TV fee or whatever. Okay. Mm-hmm. This is assuming you're in a nursing home or assisted living that's covered by Medicaid. If you're staying at home and getting uh, benefits for home care through what's called passport, uh, it's got to be a much bigger number because you still got to pay the electricity, the food, the you have groceries, to pay for utilities, okay. groceries, all that stuff. But you still, it, your allowance is first. It just, it's a much bigger number if you're staying home. Okay. And some states, uh, assisted living requires that you pay a certain rent amount, and that rent is based on Social Security. So the maximum Social Security benefit for supplemental security income, the the SSI, in other words, this Social Security disability for people who don't have a significant work history mm-hmm. or a recent enough work history. Okay, the maximum paid in 2023 is 841 dollars uh, per month. So in states that kind of use that SSI number model for their rent, again, making air quotes, at assisted livings, the assisted living is that number minus the personal needs allowance. So in Ohio, 50 bucks is your personal needs allowance, that, you know, that, that candy bar haircut thing. Um, and then, so the rent at an assisted living is 791, 841 minus 50 bucks, okay? Okay. Some states do so in Iowa would be a 21. I'm sorry, eight, eight, uh, eight, 11, the 841 minus 30 bucks, that sort of thing. Okay. Now, not all states do that. Um, so that comes out second if you're in assisted living. If you're in a nursing home, you don't worry about the rent thing. Okay. By the way, the numbers all work out the same way. Right. It's just how they are accounted. Again, bureaucrats speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after those happen, then the Medicaid recipient can pay the premium for his or her health insurance. Correct. Okay. Whether it's an advantage plan, a supplement, uh, a a cost share uh, on the premium side with an employer plan, whatever. Okay. They get to pay the health insurance premium for their health insurance because if health insurance pays, then Medicare and Medicaid get to pay less. And since the person's already needing long-term care, chances are they're going to be using a lot of health um, services. Mm-hmm. So we want the insurance to stay in place. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. So, yeah. so personal needs allowance, rent if you're in an assisted living and one of the states that uses that rent model, mm-hmm. then your health insurance premium, then whatever's left goes Most to pay of. the cost of care so that Medicaid doesn't have to. Right. Yes, if you're in assisted living, you could think of the rent as paying cost of, as, as being part of the cost of care. Yes, that would make perfect sense. So that's why bureaucrats don't do it. Okay, so the rent is a separate animal. Don't know why, but it is. Okay. Um, Crazy. So, so you notice I haven't talked about the amount of your income. No. It's simply the way it works. Personal needs allowance, rent if you have to. Uh, your health insurance premium, and the rest goes to cost of care. And then Medicaid makes up the difference between what you've paid toward the cost of care and the Medicaid reimbursement rate that was making air quotes negotiated with the care provider. Right. Okay. And at least in Ohio, care providers could be across the street from each other and you're being paid a separate, a, a different rate. It might be off by a buck a month. It might be off by 20 bucks a month. It might be off by hundreds of dollars a month, but they aren't in lockstep. Okay. But whatever that reimbursement rate is from Medicaid, that's all that Medicaid is going to pay on the long-term care piece on the custodial taking care of people every day, bathing, dressing piece. Okay. They may pay more money for the copay to go with your health insurance, Mm -hmm. but that's not the same every month. Okay. So that's not built into the, the standard rate. They just say, Oh, there's a bill for medical Medicare paid this much, the health insurance paid that much, and there's 80 bucks left, the Medicaid will pay 80 bucks. Okay. And uh, they will keep track of it for Medicaid and state recovery, which you've discussed in the past, but it's not built into that monthly use of your income. Okay. Okay. In long-term care, the monthly use of income is geared toward a, a little bit to pay for your personal needs and the rest geared at your costs of care and your costs of being in a place mm-hmm. to get care. Okay. So what but happens your, if your you routine need... room yeah. and board 
care, not so your medical care. I'm going to ask some really profound questions, but I know the answer, but I really want to, I want to That's ask fine. them of you anyway. Of course. What happens if you need new clothes? What happens That's if you need new glasses? That's what, what that happens? 50 bucks is for. Huh? That's, That's what, the what 50 that 50 bucks, bucks or 40 bucks or 35 bucks or hundred bucks or whatever is for. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's not enough if you need glasses. Okay. So we, if we go back to our resource discussions, yeah. if, if you had help from an elder law attorney to shelter some of your resources that, that you've now given to your children, or you've Correct. put into a special needs trust, a, a, a pooled special needs trust. If you're and we will child. talk about those at a later time. Yeah, we will. But if you set money aside somehow, almost always with the help of an elder law attorney, okay, is how money gets set aside. That, as far as I'm concerned, that's my client's comfort fund. Mm -hmm. If they, if there's money left in the comfort fund after the client dies, then it was improperly transferred. If it was improperly transferred, then the family gets to keep it. Correct. And if Correct. that's what my client wanted, that's great. Okay. If and that's the bet when you talked about in your last, um, you know, four segments about planning for Medicaid. This is really what this is about. Exactly. It's about preparing for other things because once you go on to Medicaid, um, you're not going to have extra money uh, right. to be able to do things like, you know, uh, take care of yourself and, yeah. you know, buy a, a pair of shoes, yeah. and there's a, which is $150 for a, pair, a good pair of shoes. Right. Um, and that's frequently a source of resentment for Medicaid recipients. Hey, I worked to earn that money. Well, Medicaid's response is, yeah, but now you need long-term care and we're not free. We simply make up the difference between right. what you can pay and what has to be paid. We're not paying everything. Yeah. Okay. So what are we talking about next? So next, now that we've got the basics of what happens with a single person, we're going to expand that into what happens with a married couple. Fabulous. And, and still focusing everyone, on income. Still yeah. focusing on income. Perfect. Jim and I will be back in the next segment. State of Ohio residents, you have a friend to help you navigate long-term care while protecting your assets. You can reach Jim at www.protectingseniors.com or just email him at J-K-O-E-W-L-E-R hyphen A-F-E. That's J-K-O-E-W-L-E-R hyphen A-F-E at protectingseniors.com.